Well, you are listening to The Human Resource, coming from Station ICRC-TV in Cincinnati. My name is Pandy, and we're going to go off the chart today. I've got Dave Hatter, cybersecurity expert from Intrust ID. This is a company that anyone and everyone in Cincinnati knows to be I don't know what on the on the cutting edge on on the on the pinnacle of knowledge for what is going on in businesses right now with all the cybersecurity issues. I mean, this is I wanted to bring this topic because Dave and his team gave a absolutely phenomenal presentation at one of the chamber meetings here about a month ago. And I sat there and thought, oh, my gosh. This is not something we should be avoiding, and HR needs to be pushing, promoting, encouraging, following, pressuring the powers to be in your organizations because of what Dave's about to share with us. Now, I know what you've been listening to on the news. I I have been, too. And I know that there are people out there who, who tell you that they know stories, but Dave, you're here to actually make this real. I'm going to try real hard, Pandy. First off, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so Intrust's been in business for 30 years, keeping bi- people's businesses productive and secure. So we see all kinds of wild things. And then you know, I've got 30 plus years in the business myself as a, I like to say recovering programmer, because that's what I did for most of that time. <laughs> but, you know, in, in seeing these things happen over and over again, I said, you know, I, I feel like I could provide more value to the community on the cybersecurity side of things, rather than trying to build software, trying to help businesses and individuals protect their assets. Because I know you see a lot of hyperbolic things in the press, but I'm here to tell you from firsthand experience, we see it every day. Businesses in Cincinnati losing tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars that in most cases, not always, but in most cases can be prevented if they would just do some simple and frankly, relatively low cost things. So, you know, we we feel like it's an important community service just to be out there trying to help businesses understand what are the risks you're likely to face and the threats and what can you do about it? Well, and this is for every business. So I want the listeners to be, don't stand there and say, oh, well, I'm too small to worry about that. Or, well, my industry is not one they would even think about, or my invoices are too small. No, no, what it, it, Dave, you have s- emphasized this over and over again in your presentation. This is everybody. It is everybody. But I also want to go back to your point about human resources because on two fronts, A, obviously human resources typically has a lot of influence in an organization. And B, they also typically have access to a lot of sensitive information that the bad guys yes. want to steal. So whether it's I want to help my organization protect my employees, my customers, my vendors, that sort of thing, or, hey, let's try to build a culture, let's work from the top down, a culture of security and awareness so that employees are less likely to get hacked and that, you know, our teams have the knowledge and awareness they need to avoid a lot of these common scams. Because, yes, there are technological solutions for all of this stuff, but a lot of this comes back to people making bad decisions that circumvent the technology put in place to stop these kind of things. So, it's not all technological. It's not all awareness or behavior. It's it's sort of a combination of all of those things. And when you do it right, you're still never going to be totally impervious. But what you can do is make your business a much more difficult target. And in most cases, unless you're some kind of high value target, like you have military secrets or trade secrets they want to steal, they're just going to move on to a softer target. And that's it's it's a combination of different things you really need to do. But awareness and the cultural perspective that this is a thing. There is no business too small. That's another common common myth. In many cases, Pandy, this isn't some guy in his mom's basement with a hoodie eating pizza and drinking Mountain Dew thinking, I think I'll attack you know Pandy's company today or Joe's garage. They have automated tools. They're running these things, scouring the internet, looking for well-known vulnerabilities like you're running Windows XP, right? That hasn't gotten updates from Microsoft for like a decade. When they find that, then they go, okay, now I'm going to go back and see what I can exploit there. So again, if you make yourself a more difficult target, if you're doing the right kinds of things, in most cases, they're just going to move on to a softer target. Now, what I heard you say was they're scanning and they, they're they doing it indiscriminately. They don't care or they're yes. not targeting the, the president's secretary. They're not targeting the finance department. They're just scanning. 
Well, it's it's a combination of both. In many cases, you know, if if you're a company like P&G, are there people specifically trying to steal your trade secrets? Yes. Are they people that realize you're a giant honey pot of cash? Yes. Are you being targeted specifically? Is your CFO being targeted? Probably. But there's the flip side of that, which is because, you know, our entire society is digital now, you know, think about it. Who doesn't spend more time working online, shopping online? Who doesn't have their face in their phone all the time? You know, there's all these new entry points for the bad guys to get in. They know this, right? And yeah, they can run scanning tools. There's a free search engine called Shodan. It's specifically designed. You can, anyone that's listening can go try this for themselves. You can go online and it attempts to find Internet of Things, so-called smart devices that are connected to the Internet. So when I find your coffee maker that's connected to the Internet and I know it has certain vulnerabilities in it, then could I use your coffee maker to get to your computer, to get into your business and steal your money? Maybe. I mean, that's a real thing. As crazy as that sounds, Come that is a real on. thing. No, I'm not. And you don't have to take my word for it. Amply documented if you just go look. So my point is, yes, they are just scanning. And in many cases, especially with these small businesses, they know they don't have the money. They don't have the, the skill. They don't have the knowledge to protect their stuff and or probably don't take it seriously for all the reasons you've said. So they make themselves an easy target, unfortunately. Now, one of the biggest cases here in Cincinnati that you mentioned in the presentation he got, he has less than 20 employees. Yes, he has a very good product. But he got hit for thousands of dollars because they tapped into his invoices. Yes. So I encourage people to check this out. This guy, I have so much respect for him. His name's Tony Strobel. He owns a company called Cincinnati Hoist and Crane. They got hit with what is now sort of known as a business email compromise scam, which, by the way, the FBI says in the last five years has caused $50 billion in oh losses. Gosh. And to Tony's credit, the only reason I would even bring his name up like this is he actually had the guts to make a video of himself basically saying, hey, I'm a small business. I never thought this would happen to me, but it did. Here's what happened, and it'll happen to you, too, if you don't take it seriously. And you can go out and just search for Tony Strobel, Cincinnati Hoist and Crane. Watch this video. I share it with small business owners all the time because I get the, yeah, I don't want to spend money on that. I don't think this will happen to me. All the stuff you said, well, here's a guy I did happen to. He's not an in-trust customer. I'm not trying to sell him anything. I just have a lot of respect for the guy because let's face it, most people who have one of these kind of incidents occur aren't exactly out there saying, look at what happened to me. So, I mean, it takes a lot of guts. But but break it down for our viewers. They tapped into his invoices, re readjusted information, and yes. the customers were paying the hacker. Exactly right. And, and folks watching may have seen like this happened to Cincinnati, but in reverse. Cincinnati got an invoice from a vendor that had been tampered with by hackers. So, I mean, this can cut both ways. And we see this all the time. If there's one single thing I would say we see regularly at Intrust, it's either someone trying to do this or unfortunately when it happens to someone. And it usually works like this. You have employees that have bad passwords. They have passwords that are the same on all their accounts. They don't use a password manager, so their password is their wife's name, dog's name, whatever. You, know, you can go online right now, Pandy, and see for the last probably 10 years, worst passwords of the year, where they compile a list from the billions of breached accounts that are out there every year. And it's the same passwords over and over, password, password123, password with an at symbol, stuff like that. The bad guys know this, right? They know that. So if you have a password like that, and you have a password like that on your work accounts, you are going to be hacked. It's just a matter of time. And then they don't have multi-factor authentication, also sometimes called two-factor authentication or two-step verification. Oh, I hate that. I, I hate it. I know people hate that. it, but I will tell you it's one of the simplest and most cost-effective things you can do yeah. to raise that bar and make yourself a harder target because it can be defeated. And their hackers, unfortunately, are getting better at defeating it. But when you have multi-factor authentication turned on, and just so everyone understands what I'm saying, that's the I want to log in. I enter my credentials, my username and password, and then the system prompts me for a code. Usually delivered by text, you get a six-digit code. Uh, there are different ways you can do it, some more secure than others, but most people are familiar with that text because if you, if you have a bank that isn't making you do this, you need to find a new bank. You're going to have all your money stolen. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. But when you have a bad password and no MFA, you make it easy for the bad guys to get in, then they'll lurk around in your account. Often what they'll do is they'll create mail flow rules so they can inject themselves in conversations. And then when people reply to them, you don't ever see it because it's going into some folder you're not aware of. So they're having a conversation using your legitimate email. Uh, we've seen 
real estate transactions where the money for like the payment on a house was transferred somewhere else. Saw a case where two attorneys were in, involved in a lawsuit, company A and company B in a lawsuit. Wait for this one. Bad guys break into company uh, attorney A's account, see what's happening, set up some mail flow rules and a folder, and then pretend to be this attorney. Agree to a settlement, have the money wired oh, somewhere. No. And attorney A, of course, has no idea that's happening. And eventually he reaches out to attorney B and is like, hey, where are we at on this settlement? They're like, what do you mean? We settled with you. Well, that money's long gone. But the, the more common thing is I find someone that's got some invoices. And this is what the kind of thing that happened to Tony. And I've seen this dozens and dozens and dozens of times with companies in Cincinnati. They see these invoices. They're going to legitimate customers. They copy the invoice. Looks exactly the same. They just change the payment information. So instead of your money going to fifth third, when, or instead of the, the customer's money going to fifth third or whomever, the customer pays what appears to be a legitimate invoice from your company, and instead the money goes overseas somewhere, never to be seen or heard from again. And that's the key here. That, that, that's the real pain point of all this is that, number one, it can be prevented. Yes. And number two, it can't, you can't recover. You, you, everything that gets lost is gone. If, if you discover a, some example of fraud like that, right away, like within a few hours or a few days, you may be able to claw some of that money back, maybe all of it if you're fast enough. But if you don't discover it through like a normal invoicing cycle and you're out 60 days saying, hey, why hasn't customer X paid me? That money's gone. You're never going to get it back. So that's, that's an important point. If you feel like you have some fraud that's happened to you, you need to act quickly. My advice would be, hopefully you have cyber insurance. That should be your first call because they have experts that deal with this sort of thing. Okay, okay. Call your cyber insurance company. Then call your attorney. Then my advice would be call law enforcement. You know, the FBI has a website, ic3.gov, Internet Crime Complaint Center. Not only is it full of good tips, but it's specifically designed to allow people to report fraud online. I also, if it was a, if you had 10000 bucks stolen, the FBI is not going to get involved. If you have a million bucks stolen, they might get involved. But I would encourage people to report it anyway, see what kind of advice and guidance you can get. Plus, it helps them know what's out there so that they can put out warnings to the public on the things to be on the lookout for. Yeah. So, yeah, internetcrimecomplaintcenter.gov, people should check that out. But the sooner you act, if you believe there's been some kind of fraud, the better, the more likelihood you'll be able to catch the money somewhere as it's because it's usually laundered through multiple stops along the way to make it harder to figure out, you know, where did it go? You mentioned AI. How will that play into all this? Yeah, you know, there's all kinds of hyperbolic stuff out there about AI. We're all going to be wiped out in 10 years, and it's going to take all the jobs and that sort of thing. And, you know, I don't believe we're going to be wiped out in 10 years. I already see some impact on jobs because with something like ChatGPT, I don't, you don't really need writers. You can just go in there and ask it a question, and it'll produce stuff. Now, it's not always perfect, and, you know, it's known for hallucinating, literally just making things up. So I would encourage people, if you use the tool, fact check whatever it tells you. My bigger concern right now is the whole concept of synthetic media, probably known better to most people as deep fakes, this idea that I can create a video or an audio or a photo or text that is just completely made up by the computer. And in particular, in deep fakes, you'll hear the term voice cloning. I, I can tell you from firsthand experience, you can go online right now, go to a free website, in about 15 minutes, train it on a voice. And then literally make that voice say anything you want. I did an interview with John Matarese from WCPO, and we cloned his voice. This is a true story. 15 minutes before he showed up, never even worked with this stuff. I found the first free thing I could find online, a site called Coqui. He came over. He read a, couple, I read a sentence a couple times into this thing. It was a little wonky. It's free. I mean, you know, you get what you pay for, right? But we were able to clone his or to digitize his voice and then literally... While he was sitting there, I typed in, hi, Grandma, this is John. I need your help. Press the button. Uh, you can go watch this on WCPO's website right now, and I will bet you, you will believe it's him. This was something where I had no prior skill, used a free site, spent less than an hour, and I would say it's 95% him. And we didn't even try to tweak it because we wanted to show people how good this is when you don't even really know what you're doing. I mean, it's amateur stuff for me. Is this what you were calling in terms of spoofing? It's part of spoofing. Spoofing is basically, in my opinion, the biggest problem we have overall because anything that's digital, it, with a few rare exceptions, and it generally requires a lot of technical skill and tools, can easily be spoofed. When the Internet was created, all the technology that makes this stuff work was designed in the late 60s and early 70s when none of, no one could envision how it would be used and security wasn't a problem. 
So it's very easy to spoof a phone number. I'm sure you've gotten calls from phone numbers that are clearly not the org coming from the organization it claims to be. There are free websites you can go to right now and make spoof calls. I've done, done an interview on that topic. Um, and, you know, if you use something like it, if you're in some foreign country and you use a virtual private network to cover your tracks and use one of these free websites, I, I believe this is primarily what's behind these swatting incidents you see, like with schools and, and Kroger and that sort of thing, where they claim there's a bomb threat or something. But, you know, a phone number can be spoofed, a text can be spoofed, an email can be spoofed. You can spoof a whole website, literally copy it and put it somewhere else. Oh it gosh. looks just like the real thing. So now you throw in these AI technologies, you know, one of the red flags that's always been a concern is you get an email, the grammar's kind of weird, it doesn't read right. Yes. That's a yes. good indication it might be a phishing email, right? It's spoofed. Well, now with something like ChatGPT, even if I don't speak English, I can have it write me perfect English copy on any topic I want, send out 100 million emails, and now instead of like, well, the period's in the wrong place, or this should have been a comma, but it's an exclamation point, or the, the grammar doesn't read right, that's all gone. Now you throw in the, vo the voice aspect of this where and people will tell me, well, how are they going to get my voice? How many people do you think watching this podcast have a voicemail that has their voice on it? I can call your phone number, record your voice off your voicemail, feed it into one of these models, and now I can make you say anything I want you to. This is technology that is freely and readily available right now. In fact, right. if you want at some future point, we'll demo it for people. Dave, let's think about this. Again, we're talking to mostly HR people and business owners. What, where, where did they start? What's, what's the really most fundamental message we want to give them today? The biggest thing I think right now, especially from like an HR perspective, is understanding this voice cloning thing. And if you don't have that awareness in your company, like going to your senior level executives and saying, hey, are you aware of this thing? Go check this yeah. out because some employee in your organization could get a voicemail yes. from the CEO or some other C-level executive authorizing who knows what. And, you know, unless there's a culture that says it's acceptable to challenge that, you know, hey, yeah. I got this weird thing, go to my supervisor, call the CFO or whatever, whatever is right for your company, understanding that this is a thing, it's not going away, you could potentially be hit with God knows what as a result. And creating that culture of it's okay to question things. In fact, it's more than okay. We want you to anytime there's anything unusual, stop and question it. You know, call a supervisor. Go what we nerds like to call out of band, right? Yeah. It's okay to pick up the phone using a number that you know because the phone number in an email or text could be spoofed and excuse me, and and literally say, Hey, I got this thing from you. Is this legit? Because that's really the only way to defeat this stuff. There's no real technological solution at this point that can tell you, well, that's not really Pandy that left me this message. It's some AI tool. Yeah. You, you need to go back to your teams. You need to go back to your supervisors, your team leads, your directors. You need to go back to all of them and just tell them flat out, tuck and hide your ego. Yes. You need to empower these employees to come and ask the right questions because every question in this topic is a good question question. Hey, if you want more information on this topic, Dave and I are going to partner on a presentation that you can, as viewers, you can participate virtually live coming up here in August. For more information and talk to Dave, you can email him at uh, Dave.Hatter at Intrust-IT.com. and happy to answer any questions. And he's good at it, guys. Uh, you can get a hold of the station. We'll be more than happy to help you. Again, that's that's what this is all about because you've been listening to The Human Resource.